Hi, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Paul Vanderclay. Uh, many will know Paul from uh, the work that he's doing in this little corner of the internet, uh, seeing prominent voice in that community, uh, but is also a pastor at Livingstone's Christian Reformed Church in Sacramento, California. And um, yeah, this has been a conversation that I've wanted to have for a little bit. Uh, I think, gosh, going back to like October of last year, we've kind of been trying to nail down a time to have some conversation, uh, obviously swimming in similar uh, scenes, overlapping uh, networks, that sort of a thing. And um, uh, this is really, um, you know, I think a, a really great time to be finally getting to talk uh, based on a lot of stuff that's been happening in those networks around uh, conversions to Christianity and this sort of broader conversation. So I'll set that uh, up a little bit more in a second. But uh, thank you so much, Paul, for joining me. I appreciate it's great it. great to be here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, setting context here. Um, a lot of stuff is happening, and you're uh, a great person to talk to uh, about all this. And and I, uh, I, I mean, we've been seeing lately this um, kind of trend uh, of um, some rather prominent folks in this scene and in, 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 I guess you could even say kind of culture, uh, making this sort of God pivot, as it's been called. Um, and uh, I recently had Jordan Hall on my uh, podcast uh, to talk to him about his conversion to Christianity, his recent conversion. Uh, but that's sort of... Um, emblematic or, or uh, you know, just sort of one instance in a, a number of other similar kind of uh, uh, changes in, in people's sort of faith commitments and Andrew Huberman and Russell Brand now, and uh, obviously going back to Jordan Peterson's um, kind of very uh, public uh, now engagement with Christianity, Christian thinkers, all this stuff. So, um, and then, uh, yeah, in response to uh, my conversation with Jordan, it got me thinking a lot about what I felt was missing from the conversation. So I then did sort of a follow-up um, talking about uh, what I'd love to see as part of a meta-modern Christianity conversation and what so far I've kind of not seen as part of that and tried to add that into the mix. And so um, my kind of hope and intention for this conversation is really to just to, to continue that, but to start something as well. Um, I appreciate your perspective a lot. Uh, you're, you know, very well read, very learned person, uh, have a deep uh, history with the Christian tradition. Of course, you're a pastor. Um, so at both kind of the intellectual and the embodied lived um you know, angle, uh, this is this is something that you can bring a lot of uh, experience to and a lot of insight to. And uh, being that we do overlap in these sort of shared networks, uh, we're talking to a lot of the same people, John Verveke, and uh, and then of course, those people talk to very similar sorts of people. So um, I, I wanted to, one, just sort of like have this as being sort of a, an opening to to merge some worlds here and start to come into each other's conversation spaces and, and bridge conversations. Um, but two, I could also see this very much being the beginning of a longer conversation and one that I feel like uh, needs to be had and that different people are bringing different important parts to. And so for me, I frame that in terms of like a meta-modern Christianity, but there are different ways of framing that. Um, and so, yeah, that was sort of my my thought about how we could tackle this. And um, that's the framing. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on how anything else you'd like to add to that. Framing no, let's, or... let's proceed. I'm, I'm really curious. I, you know, I was, I was looking at the video that you made um, where you were so, sort of going back and forth and contrasting. I thought it was very interesting when you were contrasting the, um, the, the historical critical and then the devotional, because that's something that I, when you, many people, when they come into Christian ministry from especially a more conservative Christian tradition, I mean, that that change basically created Bart Ehrman, the skeptic, <laughs> and the, the, the different tensions there. And whereas for the last couple of hundred years, Protestant and especially Protestant churches have sort of been trying to trying to hold that tension together. I mean, basically what happened is that a lot of modernists just sort of, I, I was talking to, I was talking, I had a conversation yesterday with a guy who was, who grew up in visiting, his parents didn't go to church and he grew up in the South. And so all of his friends went to church. So he wound up going to church with all of his friends and some went Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, kind of the sample of churches in the South. And then when he decides he wants to get into ministry, he decides to go to a mainline seminary 
And he's going to this mainline seminary, probably in the nineties. And one of the, one of the professors basically comes in and, and tells everyone, you know, you all want peace and justice, but if you don't have Jesus, you don't have any peace and justice because his complaint was that these mainline seminary students were living lives of complete worldliness, getting all of this study about uh, modernist interpretations of the Bible. And he said, but you don't live anything. You've deconstructed mm -hmm. it all away. And your Christianity is a, is an academic justification for your politics, but you, you live like the world. And they were sort of shocked that their professor would confront them on this. Mm -hmm. But the, obviously the professor was from a past generation that held those two things together. And I actually mm -hmm. just, somebody just sent me a, um, somebody just sent me a, a piece in the New York times talking about how, you know, conservative Christian certain, a, a split amongst conservative Christians as to whether or not you should sort of endorse this, this hot women of the political right with guns and boobs. And, mm. you know, because the past generation would look at that calendar and say, that is no place in the Christian life. And the new the new conservatives are like, hey, let's just let's celebrate masculine. Let's just celebrate masculinity yeah. and femininity uh, right there in the open. And so I think, you know, the meta modern frame, which is which says, OK, we had modernity, we've had post modernity and you can't really live in post modernity. So mm -hmm. but yet its critique is still has some yeah. validity. So. How do you put this together? And right now right. it's sort of a mess. Well, that's so, yeah, exactly. So let's jump into the mess um, and try to, uh, you know, uh, organize things a little bit and do some sense making around it. Um, because, uh, yeah, I know that you talk about like what you see as being this sort of uh, recession of modernity or that there's something going on that's that's uh, the modern is sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> well, it's actually interesting, you know, well, who's a Matthew Arnold talked about uh, the you know, in the poem Dover Beach, the sort of like incoming wave and then outgoing wave of faith, uh, the, you know, the, the wave of faith withdraws. But now there's sort of this sense that something about the modern world is also now withdrawing. Right. Um, and how we understand that, I think, is really important. Um, but so so, yeah, I. What I one of the things I'd like to do um is is get into what we think that could look like in a way that that that's sustainable, that works for people, that isn't um, you know, kind of characterized by just a great amount of cognitive dissonance or dissonance between as you were just gesturing towards like sort of, mm -hmm. you know, lived behavior versus this sort of like uh, you know, intellectualized uh, relationship to a faith, but somehow something that is a form of Christianity that's embodied and uh, and and embedded in community uh, that's praxis driven, but then also has this uh, um, intellectual depth and robustness to it that is anti-fragile and that can somehow engage with the tradition and its images, its symbols and its stories in a way that works, <laughs> but works at a level that, um, well, and this is the question, right? So, you know, in the conversation I had with Jordan Hall, it was very much... Um, the embeddedness and the community and the praxis, all that seems to to be a way into this that people can find very intuitive. But I specifically wanted to uh, explore with him the theological angle. Like, okay, given that, how do we how do we understand these ideas? How do we understand these stories um, in light of, as you say, like postmodern critique and modern critique? And so, um, yeah, that's that's what I would like to explore at least for this conversation. Um, and the last thing I, for now that I want to say too is that I wanted, I want it to be clear that uh, you know while while we maybe dance around the, these topics and explore them, uh, and we might have different opinions or we might challenge each other in certain things, but this is you know I think uh, very much coming from a place of trying to do something productive, generative, and in good faith. And so I just want both for you personally, uh, but also very much people watching this to understand that in that back and forth in the, what about this? Oh, but wait, all that stuff. Um, I hope that I don't, for example, come across during that as, uh, overly, um, sort of antagonistic, let's say, or that I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, cause that we need to, I think this is something really important that we need to get right. So I just wanted to, 
you know, put that on the table and make sure that there's that shared understanding and we can kind of continually, you know, return to, uh, you know, the kind of meta framing of, of how we're going about even having the conversation, but just wanted to throw that on the table. So, um, yeah. So I guess first question then, right. Uh, very, maybe kind of pointedly is like, what do you make of the modern historical critical lens applied to the Christian tradition and the lessons that we can legitimately take from that and should take from that going forward? I, I think the modern. So at the beginning of the 20th century, you had this major fight in the church in the West, which was the modernist fundamentalist fight. And that entire fight was a product of the continued rise of modernity and application of modernity into not only the churches, but the lives of nearly everyone. And it came at them uh, through government. It impacted families. It impacted communities. And it 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 impacted it it was a slow, it was a slow, it was a slow rise, especially in in church communities. Religious communities are designed in many ways to sort of buffer. Um, because you have different gatekeepers for your community and you're, you're watching different aspects than, than others are watching. So you have this major fight in the 20th century while the, the fight had been going on in academic circles for a while before then, but it, in the 20th century, it just starts hitting churches. And so then churches start dividing over this kind of thing. And one of the when I first sort of became aware of this, I was I was a seminary student, and I was reading modern biblical commentaries, hmm. and we'd go into source criticism, redaction criticism, all of these. You know, most people won't know what I'm talking about. For 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 a generation, the most interesting thing about the Old Testament was that you. Uh, that you had a documentary hypothesis and everyone was trying to sort of interpret the Old Testament by sussing out the the Yahwist, the priestly, and the let's say the Deuteronomic uh tradition that and and the the assumption was that the Old Testament was sort of patched together by uh incompetent editors and we have just sort of this mess of a text. And then, of course, you had this the synoptic problem in the New Testament where Matthew, Mark, and Luke are quite clearly telling the same stories, and sometimes there's word-for-word -word correspondence between them, but then there's all these other additional materials. And so the, 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 the focus in modernity was to study that which a modern mind could have access to in confidence, which were the texts themselves. And then they tried to get into the communities behind the text and trying to use what was the new modern framing of history to understand all of this. And as a seminary student, I was reading this stuff and just thinking, this doesn't help me at all as a preacher. <laughs> you know, if I get up there on Sunday morning and start talking about the documentary hypothesis or the synoptic problem, most people in the church are like, I'm, I'm just... You know, I've got, I've got a marriage which isn't necessarily easy. I've, I'm trying to hold down a job. Uh, things are changing in my world rapidly, and you want to talk about the documents behind this book that I am sort of clinging to to kind of keep some semblance of faith alive. Mm. And of course, what happens then in neo-evangelical scholarship, and to a degree before that in the UK, was a realization that while they couldn't simply ignore these, while they couldn't simply ignore modernity, it was, it was really hard for people to live with it. And so there was always, you, you would always sort of try to sneak in, okay, what is the meaning of the text and how can you apply this for your life? But, but that sort of lived in a different world from modernity. And then of course, post-modernity comes in and sort of, sweeps the whole thing away and and then all people are left with is politics 
and and mm-hmm. grievance and because that's that's the one thing that anyone can be certain of which is a history of oppression mm-hmm. um particularly among certain groups and then and then where do you go now then for if you're if you're lucky enough as i usually was to have congregations made up of mostly oppressed people then you sort of could offer them a thesis of liberation but then you bumped into eschatology and would have to say now when exactly does this liberation arrive and by whose hand and usually the idea was through a political hand and i would say that's probably sort of where i was at when i left seminary hmm. and so then i decide well if i'm you know if i'm going to go to announce liberation for oppressed people i might as well go to some really oppressed people so i go to some of the poorest people in the western hemisphere and i very quickly realized that uh most of the people that i am now preaching to and ostensibly being there to help with number one completely don't buy any of this liberation stuff because they just don't believe it because they know darn well that they are going to live and die poor and maybe just maybe the best shot they have at some degree of the kind of liberation people are trying to offer them is to get a visa for the to the united states so they can make more money Hmm. and it's like so in other words this radical liberationist slightly communistic gospel that i have when I go down to actually oppressed people, what they'd really like to be are capitalists. Then it's like <laughs> something here doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. And and then the more I am actually, you know, everybody's like, well, be with the oppressed, be with the downtrodden. And the more I am with the oppressed and the downtrodden, you know what they want? You know what they're expecting? They're expecting heaven. <laughs> they're mm. expecting an upgrade in the next life because they've looked around and they know they're going to die poor and young. <laughs> and me, because of where I'm from and the access that I have, won't be caught in that misery. And so then I got a jump on this deconstruction fairly early on mm-hmm. and had to say, yeah, uh, modernity? Okay. Uh, post-modernity, uh, even even the people that even your heroes aren't buying this stuff. So what now? And yeah, well, and, well, and yeah. So go. yeah, so so that there's a lot to work with there. Yeah, uh, a lot, there a lot going on there. So, um, one of the things that I hear, which I think is really important, I think it's I think it's very spot on, um, is the disconnect between sort of church congregations and scholarship. We'll just kind of p- put a pin in that. So there's sort of like the relationship of average church going people uh, to the kind of modern, you know, historical critical stuff coming in. It's sort of like, wait, what? How is this? I, you know, as you for all the reasons you just outlined. And then similarly, a disconnect with sort of the postmodern liberation theology approach to things that's sort of like, you know, uh, no, as you say, like, just give me a green card. Give me give me give me uh, give me some resources to improve my lot, you know, et cetera. Um, and so a grant granting all of that, right. That there is, that there's some real disconnects. Um, well, what we can come back to, I, I, I want to come back to later on the, the postmodern liberation front, but just for the sake of sort of having a, a, a very clear dichotomy to work with there, I, I want to stick with that modern traditional devotional, um, disconnect. Um, and, uh, I think that, that this comes up a lot, uh, for, uh, for people who go to seminary and then learn all this stuff and then ask that question that you did, like, how, how can I, where does this actually plug into, you know, interacting with a, with a, with a congregation and all that. Um, but I want to kind of probe that a little bit, right? Because I want to know what the, what the response is at that level, let's say, right? Like, um, like, let's say, you know, uh, you go to seminary, you learn all these things about the source criticism. You see that there are these like meaningful uh, uh, disjunctures and potential contradictions in the text and all of that. And then you get a new sense of what these texts are and what the history as we can reconstruct it might've been, et cetera. Um, But then when you go into a congregation, 
uh, and people don't want to hear that stuff, what then do you do? Because it, it would seem in some ways almost disingenuous to like pretend like all that stuff doesn't exist, right? Uh, it would seem like that would be problematic to just talk to people as though, oh, okay, we're just going to leave all that over here because this is what people need to hear or want to hear or what have you, right? And this has been a perennial issue for kind of informed seminary taught uh, pastors and ministers. It's sort of like, how does this stuff come in in a way that can connect to people's lives? So what are your thoughts on that? Like, like, uh, how, do you see what I'm saying? Like there's a, there would seem exactly to be like a, it, uh, maybe like one connection where right, it would be sort of something like, uh, uh, we can all acknowledge that like we need a robust social fabric in our sense of like, uh, thinking about the country that we're a part of. If we think about our country as just, oh, it's nothing but awful and it's just a series of, you know, oppressions and terrible people and we have no respect or regard whatsoever for, uh, you know, just like the, the the founding fathers and everything that happened, right? That leads to a kind of social fragmentation and sort of fraying of the, of the, of the civil fabric of society. Um, at the same time, right, people teaching civics classes or like AP US history uh, also have to grapple with and acknowledge like, yeah, like Thomas Jefferson did own slaves and he did father children with them or this and that, right? And like things that complicate and nuance and problematize some aspects of like that, that, that sort of national mythos. And so simultaneously, someone like that could recognize, oh, if we just push the, the, the kind of critical scholarship on all this stuff too forcefully, it's going to erode people's faith in their country and their sort of civic pride and their civic engagement. And that has del deleterious impacts on society. At the same time, we can't ignore it either, right? So I'm just going to throw that in as a basis of comparison, as sort of like, what do we do when the history says something that then, uh, you know, doesn't work with, uh, with, with sort of the, the average man on the street? And what do we do about that in a way that, that, that maintains integrity? Well, I, you you began by asking me about the church and what happens in churches is that the pastors either become political activists or therapists mm. that's what they do and that's what the churches do because and then very quickly the church realizes it has no mission because mm. you already have political parties and you already have therapists and so why would you why would you sa give sacrificially for an institution that has already outsourced its mission to two other institutions, to either the political scientists or to the psychologists? And that is exactly what has been happening in churches, in the mainline church. That's sort of the destruction of the mainline church that I'd say mm -hmm. it's 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 collapse overall. Now, so that, you know, then the 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 question is, who is we when you ask that question? And so as a, as a minister, that's exactly what I've seen happen to people who sort of get caught in that bind. Unless you can figure out, and I think this is where we come all the way back to where we started in terms of Jordan Peterson, Jordan Hall, this little corner, Jonathan Peugeot, John Verveke, these kind of questions because these kind of questions are are coming around to the question, okay, well, what, what, why, where is the role of, now you can sort of abstract it and talk about the sacred or the divine, that whole thing in sort of a functional um, approach. Or if you're in a church, well, why, you know, when I was in Europe a couple of, couple of summers ago, you know, I noted that in every little town you had, you had a church in the middle of these little towns and you had these spires and steeples to connect heaven and earth. And this is an alien technology to us. We don't know why those buildings are there or what to do with them. In fact, that's a that's a real problem for some places. Is they they really don't know what to do with these buildings because they're they're too beautiful to tear down and they're iconic, but they don't know what they're seeing through them too. And so what I think we're seeing in this new renaissance of religion is a reappreciation for something that was lost, but we're still struggling to figure out how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, right. And so that is the question, right? Is sort of like, how do you talk about it? How, like, what is different about a minister or a pastor from a psychologist or a political activist? Um, once there's some 
grappling with that modern historical critical stuff, it seems to uh, have the effect of sort of changing the game for a lot of people and sort of changing the register. And so like what what remains in that uh, area of conversation um, is is one way of asking the question. Um, and 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 I, I another thing that is a real a very, I think, important framing device for me, and I'd like to get your take on it, is um, is is grappling with the ways that uh, that there is, let's say, a kind of developmental angle to people's relationship with faith and religion. Um, and when we look at how uh, over the course of the lifespan, people's views change, their their notions of faith change, this sort of a thing, um, then I wanted to throw that into the mix. And again, we'll be kind of probably a, a, a continual touchstone or a leitmotif because we'll keep coming back to it, I, I have a feeling. Um, because one way of framing all this, right, could be, uh, yeah, people might, um, how would you say, there might be a certain uh, attraction to uh, functionality for and and even necessity for certain, say, mythological framings um, in certain living conditions and certain life conditions, um, especially in the kinds that you're talking about, where you know uh, if you're if you're if you're facing oppression, if you're facing a lack of resources, if you're facing uh, those sorts of dynamics that. Uh, that will engender certain ways of thinking about the divine, the religious, et cetera. When modernity then does start to spread and you start getting uh, the kind of increase in the quality of life and the people and people's sense of sort of uh, economic financial stability and this sort of a thing, uh, there does seem to be the shift away from the certain modes of sort of mythological anthropomorphic ways of thinking and then into sort of more abstract, general, uh, rational ways of thinking. And we could dive into all that and we could even pick it apart and we could critique that narrative. But it is a narrative. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that, that um, everything you're saying might be the case. Case, but it doesn't necessarily change or speak to the issue of like uh, the reality of the of the material considered, right? Like just because people might uh, resonate with or feel the need for a certain kind of religion doesn't necessarily make that real either, right? So you know that's a that's a, a frequent kind of line of way uh, you know, way of thinking about this. So anyway, your thoughts on any of that. One of the early questions when I started, because I, I mean, I've been pastoring for a long time, and then I've been thinking about these issues for a very long time, and then Jordan Peterson comes on the scene, and and I'm watching what's going on around him, and I'm trying to use, I'm blogging a little bit about him, I'm talking about him in a listserv that I participate in, and not getting the kind of traction I really want. Most of my colleagues look at me and they're like, I'm going to spend two, three hours a day listening to a Canadian psychologist ramble on about the Bible. I've got work to do. Fair enough. Um, and so then I start talking on YouTube. And right away, one of the real, one of the big questions is, what do we mean by this funny word, real? Because Eugene Peterson... Uh, who was a a Christian writer? Um, he was he was a pastor in a mainline Presbyterian church, and they were doing church planting, and so it, it, he would and he, he was a good writer. He, he wrote a number of books, very popular books, but he would always be galled when he would finish preaching a sermon. And this was back when it was still the alignment between church. When, when Christian nationalism was you so ubiquitous, we didn't have to point it out in other people. Um, you know, some some smart businessman would say, oh, that was a fine sermon, Pastor, but now we're out, we're going to get out here into the real world. And Eugene Peterson would be like, you know, part of him, something would turn inside. Mm. Part of what's happening is that when Jordan Peterson starts lecturing about the biblical lecture, people begin to see, oh, maybe the patterns in the Bible are still with us today. Hence, I can improve my map of the world if I read the mappings of the Bible. And of course, mm -hmm. Jonathan Peugeot comes along 
and basically says the same things, but in more artistic, less psychological language. And John Verveke comes around and starts saying similar things, but now in the frame of cognitive science. I think the reason people... Modernity isn't sort of... We don't deconstruct what we assume. I'll say it that way. And modernity begins to recede when we start seeing its edges. And all religions are sort of agendas to achieve the eschaton, our best life, to achieve the sumum bodum, the greatest thing. And it's very reasonable that coming out of the medieval period, entering into the early modern period, we sort of together made an assumption that what it really takes to have your best life now is political stability, economic prosperity, uh, good health, um, uh, satisfying relationships, and the path to all of these things is basically getting a handle on usually affluence. So um, if you have enough, if you have a decent roof over your head, if you can get your material needs satisfied, if you can have enough material needs so that you can satisfy some of your other emotional needs, and it's a pretty strong argument. If all of these things are working together, well, you should be satisfied. But, you know, very fairly early on, people like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky look at this and begin to say, it doesn't really seem to work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, many Haitians in the Dominican Republic who do not have a decent roof over the head, do not have enough to eat, do not have political stability, do not have many of the things that we in the West enjoy, they're like, well, I'd be willing to take a crack at it. <laughs> um, you know, people you some, sometimes find on Christian refrigerators, you know, Lord, make me strong enough to be able to win the lottery. Um, okay. And, but what we begin to discover in the West is that this project of harnessing the physical universe in order to satisfy ourselves doesn't seem to work. Now, of course, Jesus made suggestions about that a very long time ago. You can gain the whole world, but lose your soul. And it's like, well, what if we decide we don't have a soul and we just stick with the world? Well, the funny thing was that the soul began to crop up. And I think that's sort of where we're at now, where yeah. people begin to, you know, and you can see this in someone like Tom Holland, who he has a hit book called Rubicon. He's a successful author. He's living in London. He has everything he wants, but he begins to have doubts. And that's where we're at. Now, pointing to someone like Ian McGilchrist. The... Well, but, but before, go I ahead. just want to yeah, throw some thoughts. So yeah, just to, like, I agree with all of that. I think that that's a very important framing and also one that can really kind of help clarify something important um, because there was this sort of, um, you know, myth of progress, capital P, the, the grand narrative of modernity that was, yeah, you know, uh, just focus on the material goods and this sort of thing. And then we'll actually solve all the things that religion used to say, you know, thought it, that it was going to attend to. Right. And this is sort of the story for uh, some number of centuries and Marxist uh, materialism picks this up and, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and empirically, we found that 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 has some reality, but it actually then stops. Right. It's sort of like you do need, a, as you say, a roof over your head. You need you need a certain level of um, of sort of resources and, and 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 safety and well-being and all that stuff. But then that starts to plateau and then your well-being is no longer tied to those things just in a linear way. And the amount of kind of increase at the material level to engender any modicum of increase in like general well-being is, you know, the, the, the ratio becomes increasingly large. So I totally agree with that. And I mean, 
this is itself kind of accounted for in theories of modernity, uh, like uh, Ronald Englehart's work talking about sort of post-materialist values and you move into the postmodern and now beyond world where, um, where yeah, we've kind of acknowledged that. And there's this longing for uh, a, a greater sense of depth and meaning and the sacred and the spiritual. And so that's different from, you know, uh, uh, I, I would say the articulation for religious longing uh, pre in a pre-modern context. And I think that that's an important distinction to make. Um, and I think that that's what we're currently grappling with. And one of the things that I'm seeing, though, is that in that moment where people are having that sensation and, and reaching for that, uh, the, it seems like the only thing available to them is pre-modern forms of religion. So then they sort of like kind of jump into some version of that. And for me, the challenge is like, well, that's going to create a lot of problems, a lot of cognitive dissonance, a lot of a lot of this and that. Uh, so how do we articulate, how do we live some kind of spiritual, sacred uh, existence uh, in a post-materialist context? Um, and so I wanted to clarify that, too, because I'm not I'm not uh, by framing religion, uh, religious conceptions developmentally. It's not to make the case that all forms of religion are just sort of like pre-modern people want stuff and so they, you know, project this heaven or whatever. Uh, but I do think it's relevant to appreciate that some form of religious expressions are some version of that, uh, but that what we're currently grappling with is sort of uh, this different context. Um, so I wanted just to, 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 to say all that, but I also now, I mean, and I don't want to cut you off if you wanted to go somewhere else with no, this, but you, you brought up the real. And this is, I think, really the stumbling block for me in my thinking about this stuff, because it's like this something is really important here that we have to grapple with. But yeah, like, what do we mean by the real? You know, um, like uh, I, I and I also buy what you were saying that like Peterson and others can draw out the patterns and the psychological mappings and all this stuff in a way that's of great utility and worth to people and in a way that they can affirm in a modern context. Um, but that's different from saying that those stories are real in the way that certain people want to interpret that, right? Like Bruto Bettelheim wrote a lot about fairy tales and their utility, but no one would say that, you know, uh, Little Red Riding Hood is a real story about historical things, right? So we need to be clear about what we mean by real. And I think this is where a lot of the confusion is coming in and what I want to kind of tease apart, because I think that a lot's getting smuggled in when we when we talk about what's real in the religious traditions here. And there's a lot of confusion around saying, hey, there is some deep archetypal patterns here and insights about the nature of reality and truth and our experience of, of relationships, et cetera, versus a person was born, you know, in ways that completely contradict, contradict the laws of nature as we understand them. And, uh, and, and, and there were these miraculous things that happened and, and, and there's not a lot of clarity around what we mean by the reality of those things. So can you speak to some of that? I mean, um, I have a sense that we might have a different conception between the two of us of 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 the reality of these kinds of stories. Like, um, can you speak to how you think of these stories as being real, specifically in relationship to like the historical aspect of of things? Okay, but now you we're going to talk about this word real, and you yeah. just basically used historical like a modernist, I assume, mm. because what what the historical question what the historical quest is is trying to get some kind of correspondence between a physical state of affairs and a, a group of words because that tended to be the modernist framing and conception for example how is uncle sam real that's a question that, oh uh uncle sam is real as a as a symbolic creation that we refer to but there is not actually a person who exists named uncle sam you know and there does never uncle has sam been. have a body uh no and not in in the in the way that we would think of that sort of a thing and and well go on go on this well yeah. uncle sam doesn't have a body like i have but i would say uncle sam does have a body but well, you have to then ask the question what is a body yeah because, and so and now you know i yeah. I have a church body. My church body meets here in this place on Sunday, but not all of it is here. We have a body politic. And so, and this is this is exactly the 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 key reframing that has been happening in this little corner. But, that but we there, begin there's to a lot of 
there's sorry, but there's a lot of equivocation going on there, right? Because like a word like body can mean a bunch of different things. Oh right? yes, like, it can. Yeah, exactly. So then, as can just, history, as can oh, real. Yeah, yeah. So then, then it warrants having conversations like this where we can get some clarity about what we mean rather than uh, absolutely you know, sort of talking absolutely. past each other. Um, real quick, I do want to make a plug for the work of Jason Storm, who explores just these topics in his book, Metamodernism, talking about he 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 has a frame of meta realism and that what we mean by real is in, in what we mean by real is a is a contrast term, right? There is no absolutist sense of what we mean by real. If you say that that's not the real Madonna, are you talking about it's not the real, you know, singer Madonna? Do you you're not you know all this stuff, right? right. So we have to be careful with how we use this word, and we can appreciate that mo uh, real is a kind of a modal term that has you know. So I just want to throw that in, and I don't want to get too technical or philosophical, but I'll, let's drill down on this, right? So when you asked about Uncle Sam, does he have a body? Well, body now is re relating to this idea of Uncle Sam as a person, right? But then now we're switching and we're using this term body metaphorically to talk about the the body politic. And it's like, that was sort of a, a little turn that happened. But if we can just say, well, that's also real, then we're kind of just going to keep not really getting to the crux of it, right? No, but so, we're getting to your definition of what you mean yeah. by real. Yeah. Because most people mean physical when they say the word real. And I would uh, I would I would argue that Uncle Sam in fact has a physical body, but it's not the kind of body that you are currently seeing little bits of mm -hmm. in uh, over Zoom right now. Mm -hmm. And we've been using that word body. For example, is mm -hmm. school spirit real? Uh, yes. Yeah, and a school has a body. A school has a bunch of students that we refer to collectively as a as a body. And yeah. we've been using that word for that collection of students for a very long time, mm -hmm. as we've been using the word spirit. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to say that because of what the Japanese Empire did, Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam strode across the Pacific and beat the Imperial Japanese Navy to a pulp, that would be a very real statement. It would be a metaphorical statement. It would be using a, a representation of, a, you know, historical actuality and then like alighting it in a kind of poetic way. Uh, but but this is this is the point. Right. So like so then like we need to be able to disentangle these different forms of the real. And and so this is what I want to drill down on. Right. It's sort of like if we want to talk about Christ resurrected from the dead, a lot of people mean that as. There was a human being whose physical body came back to life and then he went and walked around again, right? Now, another way you could say Christ, you know, resurrected from the dead is, well, his spirit lives on and it changes the world, et cetera, right? And that would be real in all the ways that you're talking about, but it means something very different. And it, it's important that we get that meaning uh, right. So like, so if you don't mind me asking, like kind of directly, do you think that like, uh, Christ physically, historically, as a person, came back to life, and that and that that is what the resurrection is 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 speaking to. I think that Thomas touched his wounds. So, so like, yes, so that he the physical body no, of because uh, you he, see here's the here's the problem. We can say. All of language is metaphorical. It just is. And I mean, I just said, it. I can't, I, we can't speak in any other way. And we always speak this way. And there's actually no way of getting around it and no way of living in the world. Because well, well, even if you're using, even yeah. if I say, um, one plus one is two. Well, how is this two? This isn't two. It's, and and that gets to the very basis of our technology and of because we're always representing the world with symbols. But but like to to shift the conversation out of such a charged context or content as religion, if we were to apply this in other areas of life, it would create a lot of problems, right? Like if if you're if you if your child uh if you ask them, hey, did you take the car on Saturday? And they say no. And then it turns out that actually they drove the car on Saturday and then they came back and they crashed it or whatever. Um, and then you'd confront them. You're like, wait, I asked you, did you take the car on Saturday? And you said no. And they said, well, I didn't take the car. 
you know, taking implies, uh, you know, this, right. So like we can play all sorts of games with language, I'm but not, what you I'm were not, trying to, I'm not, ask, I'm not asking to play games. I'm just yeah. trying to point to how we already use language and the ways that we have been using language, you yeah. know, for example, literal does not mean physical. And almost every time someone says literal, they really mean physical because mm. they're asking, let's say about the body of Jesus of Nazareth that mm. all of his disciples saw. And embedded in these are a whole bunch of assumptions such as, um, I, I actually just picked up Carlos Erie's recent book, They Flew, where you have all of these crazy stories, which actually really pick up in the early modern period of like levitation. And we all know people don't fly, mm -hmm. even though, yeah, there certainly is equivocation when I say I flew to Detroit. Well, I used an airplane, right. um, but so and and so, and so a lot of what's been happening is like for me, I have never really had a problem with all sorts of things that I read in the Bible, such as healing miracles. And I think recently we we had an amazing demonstration. Tammy Peterson, um, not only did Tammy Peterson have a form of cancer that for the last, I don't know how many decades, zero people who have had her kind of cancer have been alive one year after diagnosis. Zero mm -hmm. of everyone who's had that kind of cancer. And then she and she had two doctors and they went around to the best doctors that they could buy and they have a lot of money. And then she tells her husband, God is going to heal me on our anniversary and then she's cancer free and she's cancer free now. And we look at this and we say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. How do we use language around something like this? And we just don't know. But well, the, the world is full of this. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot to that. <laughs> I yeah. mean, um, so. So we. So can... yeah, so so in terms of Jesus, yeah, Jesus, Jesus walked out of that grave. But what's interesting is that we don't have any the, the the gospels don't write that. And when you get to the resurrection, it actually gets very weird mm -hmm. because do they recognize him? Do they not recognize him? What about the wounds? I mean, it yeah. gets very weird. And in many ways, our language isn't helpful because we say Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus raised uh, Jairus's daughter from the dead. Jesus raised the the son of the widow of Nain from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is like that, but it's also not like that. And Christians have always said that too. And mm -hmm. then Jesus flies up into the clouds. Right. And actually, this Christians have been talking about these kinds of issues for a very long time. And one of the, I think, one of the best, most one of the best modern treatments of this is C.S. Lewis's book on miracles, because mm. when when we ask a question, so Lewis then in that in a chapter in that book focuses on the ascension, and when we say in the Apostles' G Creed, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, on one level, a whole bunch of people might, in their imagination, picture kind of a cloudy blue space and mm -hmm. a really well-decorated chair, and another little smaller chair right next to them. And then, well, they might think of something, let's say, that they saw in the Sistine Chapel on the yeah. big chair, and then they yeah. might see something that, let's say, they saw in some Christian campy art on the chair next to it. And so then we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, what do we mean by that? Right. Is is is, is and, and this gets really complex with Jesus because, again, Thomas touched his body, but he came into a locked room. So all of these questions are surrounding us. And, and what happens in the modernist fundamentalist fight is that fundamentalists start saying, yeah, he physically rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. Or they'll usually say he literally rose from the dead, which is even more correct because we're talking about what the words on the page say mm -hmm. instead of physical correspondence. And that's the way modernity sort of sneaks in. But what else are we saying and how are we using language? And in fact, that is yeah. 
when it when it comes to meta modernity, I think where a lot of our focus is, which is modernity. In modernity, we began using language in a different way, and we began making distinctions like we didn't make before. And part of the difficulty is that once we start making certain distinctions, we can't unmake them, but then we don't quite know what to do with language. For example, Owen Barfield, one of C.S. Lewis's good friends, mm -hmm. he was a philologist. He goes back in time and says, you know what? People usually didn't used to dis distinguish between, let's say, spirit and wind. Mm -hmm. And today we would say physical wind is air blowing against my skin that I can feel. And we just started talking about school spirit. And we easily, we don't say, um, let's have a pep rally to really increase school wind. Mm -hmm. But if you say it that way, actually you begin to recognize that there's a whole lot of wind involved in that, in that pep rally, isn't there? Well, so, and, okay. and so, and, yeah. and these are the questions that we are now wrestling with. Sure. And, uh, I mean, if I could just take a couple stabs at some of this stuff, I want to come back to the miracle thing um, specifically or as it related to the cancer diagnosis and all that, because I actually think um, I think it it provides a good opportunity to explore some of the real uh, ethical issues that get caught up. If, if we how, see how did things... you use real there? Uh, what, uh, what did you I say? Just real say... ethical issues. The... Are ethical issues real and in what way? Well, there I was using real more emphatically, like really, you know, like uh, like this is really important. No, but I um, think you're also using it in the other way because yeah, they're the, real ethical issues. They well, really matter. So sure, and if you want, we can have a whole conversation around the reality of of ethics. I mean, I'm happy to do that too. I have thoughts about that, but um, obviously that'd be a bit. I, don't, uh, I, I see. I'm having fun right now. I hope you're having fun. Because I'm having this is fun what too. I enjoy doing. Okay, yeah, good, 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 good. Yeah. That's, so because you gave that little disclaimer early and. I mean, I don't mind. I don't mind. This is the kind of conversation I enjoy having. So good, good, going. good. No, good. No, I, the disclaimer up front was because um, these are sensitive topics for people. I mean, like my, like many family members of mine would w watch this conversation and probably be very mad <laughs> about my line of questioning. So uh, this is very intimate. Uh, and and I and let's not also lose the fact that you use the word sensitive, mm -hmm. and you didn't use it really in a physical context because. We would generally use sensitive in terms of, but sensitive in a body. Because I would say that you use the word perfectly. Mm -hmm. Because in terms of the body that is your family, what we're doing right now is quite sensitive. Yeah. In terms of a world that is by no means, it's connected to the physical world, but it's governing the physical world. Sure. Well, so... Yeah, to re to reply to some of this, um, I hear multiple things being said at the same time in a way that some of them I can affirm, and then and then it's sort of like, but then the next sentence is like, oh wait, but that's back to this other way of thinking. Yeah. Right? And for me, there's a lot of what lands uh, as as a conflation going on, and that's yeah. what I want to tease apart, right? Yeah. Because um, uh, there, if we are going to do the sort of exegesis of the text as um as focusing on symbol and uh an extension of meanings uh right like um like for example you mentioned Jesus uh, ascending into the sky um so there's on the words of the page Jesus ascends into the sky you know uh so that's that, literally true the, and the, the words on the page that's those what are the we words mean by on the literal. page yeah. uh so the words on the page are that but this is a these are Jesus is a as a person in the story and ascend uh, you know, suggests they move up, yeah. And then the sky is a reference that we know of, and so this all together red uh, creates a picture in our minds that has been depicted, and you know, a lot of art of Jesus floating up into the sky, right? Okay, so that's sort of um, that's one reading. Now, uh, in the past, in pre-modern contexts. Uh, Yes, people had very different senses of causality. There weren't the 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 modern notions uh, uh, of of uh, of how certain phenomena behave in certain regular uh, uh, naturalistic ways, and so uh, a, a statement like that in a text would land as, "Yep, he went up in the sky." Like that's what happened. Um, but now, after all that, then we have to fold that in, right? So then we're like, "Huh, okay, so." 
human beings don't like ascend into the, into the sky uh that we that we've ever seen uh no you're looking at me like i'm that's not there's true. all sorts of i mean again just look up Carl, carlos erie just book just came out they flew that's the title of the book okay yeah and, so, and he gets into this question because okay. it's it's a very remarkable question and okay. you'll find you can go to tibet and you can ask people in buddhist monasteries do people levitate so, oh yeah you go to the right. catholics ask the catholics do people levitate they'll say oh yeah yeah, well, they've but got, those they are both pre-modern. Of it. Those they are, do, but, those and so are, then the question would be, why yeah. don't you think this happens? Um, right. So then, then the answer to, in my mind to that is that uh, there's a a lot that changes in our understanding of the workings of reality uh, between the pre-modern and the the modern periods. And you get people like Newton coming along. You get the Galileos. You start tracking the. Uh, the 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 mechanisms at play right and we start being able to put uh laws to these sorts of phenomena that there's a law of gravity and it behaves in such and such a way and you can predictively drop things in the land here blah 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 these get developed and complexified into the whole robust apparatus of scientific thought um and then this begins to change uh people's perspective on the world and also then and i think that there is a lot of truth to this as well uh that needs to be accounted for in an, in a sensitive way that sociologically the worldview that you inhabit uh sort of uh you could say permits or inhibits certain kinds of interpretations or uh or even experiential phenomena right um now i want to be clear from the modern perspective i think you could even totally affirm that uh but the understanding would be that um people if there, oh, I mean, the classic, you know, example would be uh, if you grow up uh, Christian, let's say, in a in a medieval Catholic context, um, strong chances are if you have a religious vision, you're going to see Jesus or Mary or one of the saints, right? You're not going to see Buddha. You're going to see Krishna, right? So, like, uh, at the same time, you hop over to the to the subcontinent, and if you have a, a vision, you're going to see those entities, and so clearly. Uh, your cultural worldview and the sorts of symbols and all that available to you is going to uh, inform the kinds of uh, experiences that you have and how you interpret them. And this is all very complex. I don't mean to overcomplexify it, but like uh, there is a profound way in which every single person gets socialized into a particular worldview and then that factors into how they see things. So I think that um, what I would say though is that this isn't relativistic. It's not sort of like, yeah, well, if you're, you know, if you're all if you're just socialized in here versus here, it's it's all the same. And you know, that's the postmodern move. The metamodern move is to say, no, this is all true. And if you enter into a different worldview, you're gonna have different kinds of experiences and different kinds of interpretations. But we can relate those worldviews to each other and actually track the ways in which one leads to the other and that one develops out of the other, and one reveals more about uh, the complexity of reality more than others. And so that, I think, is one of the key metamodern approaches, is trying to show that, like, actually, modernity really got some things really right about the, mechani the mechanical nature of certain things and naturalistic forces, etc., uh, over and above the pre-modern worldview and that like if we don't do that justice then like we're going to be in trouble and like you know we won't have airplanes you know i agree 100 we'll percent. yeah so so there's that um and hang on a second i got a homeless guy yelling at me okay i'll be right back you could pause it if you want okay go for it <laughs> um so uh so yeah to to bring all that back uh i would say that uh when when now we read a text like uh, Jesus ascended into the heavens, right? Now, given all the hundreds of years that have passed and the new information that we have about what we even mean by the heavens, which is that like not Olympus and not, you know, clouds with a, a firmament and this sort of a thing, but actually like this vast ocean and expanse of space with planets, all this stuff, right? And what we mean by ascend, levitate, et cetera, um, from the modern lens, those things are no longer viable uh, sort of interpretations of that text. Now, now, but two things there. No, right, what, right. What, so, what, what, see, I'm not. I don't think that's true. Okay. Yeah. So, the, so the, the, there, there are many people that say this can't happen because people don't levitate. But there, there are. That's a tiny group of people, and you know. Here, I'll give you another example. So, well, let me, I can give you a great example that I use on the channel. Daniel L. Everett was a uh, conservative Christian. He was a 
He wanted to translate the Bible for a group of people. He went to that people. He lost his faith in the end. But he tells a really funny, he opens the book with a really funny story where he and his daughter, they're living in this village. And suddenly there's a whole commotion in the village. And the everyone in the village is like, there's, you know, there's the God. There's there's a God across the river. They're polytheists, they're animists. There's a God across the river. And the whole village is in there pointing out the God. And he and his daughter, so his daughter's grown up among these people. They get up and they look across the river and they don't see the God. Well, is the God there? I don't think modernity, you know, and actually if you look at someone like C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis would say, well, who's lying? Well, I don't think, Daniel Everett and his daughter hmm. are lying. They're not liars. Yeah. I don't think the village is lying. I agree. So then you have the question, why can't they all see the same thing? Right. And then if you go down to, you know, then we get into like cognitive science, we begin to recognize that when I walk into this room, and actually, I actually learned this years, years before, because I knew someone with very low vision. And I actually would have conversations with him about what he would see and what he didn't see and what I would see and what I don't see. And, and we begin to recognize that this whole business of seeing is a lot more complex than it is. Now, mm -hmm. to the degree that modernity says someone there is a liar, then I think modernity is wrong because I don't think anybody was lying. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think any, I think, I, no offense to C.S. Lewis, but I always found the liar, lunatic Lord thing to like kind of miss the whole point. Like, Well, you should definitely read, you should definitely read his, his, his treatment of the Ascension in his book, Miracles. Okay, because um, it, because it gets into all of these issues, and basically, you know, and this again is why why we're sort of getting beyond modernity because even our theories of sight, I mean, we see with our brain, we ought, that involves our eyes. Mm -hmm. So if your eyes are going bad, you know, your brain will have difficulty seeing some things, but this business of seeing is a lot more complex than we thought it was. Yeah. Well, and I agree with all that, right? So like, even just to use a very immediate example, like still if, at my parents' house, if I go down in the basement and it's super dark, I'm like, it gives me the willies a little bit, right? And even though rationally, I know that like, but there's no goblins or anything down here, or whatever. But like, just that, like entering a dark space, especially if you've just like watched a creepy movie or something, like you're just jittery and on edge and you have this embodied sense of like, ugh, right? Now- if you inhabit a world in which that feeling is actually directly related to, you know, entities to to demons or to spirits or jinn or what have you, then um, that feeling can actually translate into there's a there's a spirit down there, and I I don't oh, know. There's, right. there's a lot of spirits down there, and so you know, then what's interesting is that we get this layered uh, effect from uh, sort of cultural intellectual evolution where we can have an embodied sort of uh, primate experience or a certain kind of like very uh, I don't know, low level kind of brainstem experience uh, where something is triggered in us at a very primal level, but then overlaid on that, we got our neocortex being like able to think about that from sort of a meta level and assess it and all that stuff. And then you get that kind of dissonance of like, oh, I feel all creeped out right now, but I know that nothing's wrong rationally. You see what I mean? But also those proclivities, those faculties uh, are are emphasized in different cultural contexts in different ways. Mm -hmm. And especially before there's even kinds of studies done about certain phenomena, then there's no reason not to believe in certain kinds of things. And so when you live in a social context and you have that embodied experience and it affirms certain things about experience and reality, then yeah, you will see a God on the other side of the river. And if you, if you don't inhabit that world, you're not going to see it. But I think the modernist lens would say no one's lying, uh, but people might be pointing to a phenomenon that they're not accurately uh, understanding or or representing to themselves. That they're Ooh, which that's... which group would be that? I would say in that context, if someone sees a god across the river, that would be that would be a kind of illusion in the same way. This from the modern lens would be that would be in the same way that. Um, uh, any kind of, uh, like if we see a mirage, right? You know, there's all these stories of, you know, oh, there is this in the desert or, or you know, seeing great sea monsters and things like that. And then over time, it's sort of like, oh, this person was actually probably seeing, you know, uh, like a whale penis or the, or we also know the, the kind of, um, 
shimmerings effect that that plays of light can you know cause right and so then after that rational explanation gets overlaid it's sort of like oh okay well that's what that was um but that's then you know uh if well, we're let, trying to think about, about it you going back home because yeah. i think that's a great example so you go back home and if you're like me uh, when I would, when for example, when I was a missionary overseas, my parents were still living in the house that I grew up in. I came back home. I had my wife and my child, and I lived in my home. I, I it was really funny because when I was in the home, I always sort of felt. I always, I always sort of felt sort of like I was a kid again in some ways, even though at that point I was a husband and a father and all of those. There, there was in a sense a spirit in that home. Then when my parents moved to a different home, I didn't quite feel the same way. The, the spirit wasn't in the new home in the way it was in the old home. Just like if, let's say, you go back to, let's go, you go back to the, can you go back to the school that you went to high school in? Now, you might enter the building and you might feel the spirit in the building. So there very much is a spirit in the building. And so what we're, what in a lot of ways we're getting at is the reality of the spirit world that's what we're but talking about but it's not a spirit in the building it's an experience someone is having based on their memories and their whole nervous system embodied you know experience from that that then let's gets say they by... tore down the building you went to and built a new building and you went in you wouldn't feel the same way because no, the it's... spirit was in the building well the spirit isn't in the building because the spirit isn't a thing it's an it's an experience that is triggered transjectively. The spirit by... isn't a thing. No, school I don't think... spirit is very much a thing. Talk to the principal. Talk to the teachers. Talk to the students. School spirit is very real and it's very much a thing. The question is, what kind of a thing is it? Well, but, that's right. the question. So, are you familiar with the idea of like reification, like uh, or or misplaced concreteness and this sort of stuff, right? Like um, that that a lot of what we call things are processes for one. And that's kind of Whitehead's point that like Western philosophy has a kind of misplaced concreteness because it looks at a lot of processes and calls them things. And we have a substance ontology that, you know, needs to be corrected for by a process. Uh, we, do have a, we do have an ontology that needs to be corrected for it. Well, Verveke uh, introduces every now and then he introduces the concept of the, of the hyper thing. So mm. the economy is a hyper thing. I, I don't like the term because it has the word thing in it. And because I think the ecology or the economy is more like a spirit than a thing. Because when I think about a thing, I think about like this lens cap. But I can mm -hmm. use the word thing for the economy and I can use the word thing for school spirit. But I think that actually the economy is more like a spirit than like a thing. Um. Well, let's let's take all this conversation, but then switch contexts and see if that reveals anything. Okay. Um, so, uh, which is basically to say, let's shift into a different religious tradition. Okay. Um, my, my understanding is that um, there's a story, for example, I'm not sure if it's in the Quran or the Hadith, but it's in part of the Islamic tradition that uh, Abraham uh, on a horse was on the temple Mount and then basically ascended into heaven from the temple Mount on a horse um that's that's a claim that's actually structurally very similar to like jesus ascending into heaven yep. uh did that um however you want to go I'll about answering that, did that happen <laughs> is that real did it you know did abraham physically mount a horse and ride up into heaven yeah i don't know but i'm a little skeptical okay but when if i ask you did jesus ascend into heaven physically what's your answer i think so Okay, so can you explain why you're skeptical of one and and not the other? Because I'm a Christian. Okay. Is that like, but now if someone were like, hey, uh, someone stole the candy from the store, uh, I think it was your sister. And then if another person's like, well, I think it was your sister. It's like, well, why do you think that? It's like, well, because my sister is my sister, so I have to protect her. And the other person's like, well, right? They're like, that's not a good reason to think that something didn't happen. So just because you're part of a tradition or a family or something doesn't mean that like your sister didn't steal the candy yeah. or that your story might not have happened. So why uh, why does saying because I'm a Christian give you more credence into that? story versus well, I, it, it's you asked me why i believe it is because i grew up believing it so it's pretty easy for me to believe one rather than the other 
I mean, and and it's I mean, and everybody will accept that. That that doesn't mean that necessarily. If you have to answer the question, did Abraham physically mount a horse and fly up into heaven? Paul Vanderclay is the best person to ask. You're in trouble in terms of how you exactly want to want to figure out whether or not this happened. I mean, but, we could use it as just a an example of and and then many, when we get many... into my sister. That's a very different situation because I know her quite well. Uh, maybe yeah. let's say. Um, there, there's a lot of, I mean, part of the difficulty with history is that we really don't have access to a lot in terms of the physical layer. In fact, very little in history do we have access to, let's say, physical layers. And of course, crimes get into this because, you know, they, they don't let anybody in the scene. So, so then we're sort of in the realm of, of, human testimony. And then we have to figure out what to do with human testimony. And we begin to, and anybody who deals with human testimony on a regular basis, just even a car accident or something like that, figures out that on one hand, witnesses are sometimes unreliable, but often they're the only thing we have. And so then we're stuck in that realm. Yeah. And, well, and, and even when you get to, so, so as a preacher, let's, we can go back to the resurrection of Jesus, because I don't think that's necessarily more sensitive than the ascension when we're talking about the kinds of things we're talking about here. The, the difficult, so, so people would come to me and they'd say, okay, pastor, let's, I'll even give you that Jesus walked out of the tomb and Thomas touched his hands. I'll give you that. And then he flew up into the sky. Now, so what? Ah, there's a good question. Now we're asking a good question because history is full of strange things. And when you look at, let's say, um, you know, there books are, you know, Tammy Peterson's miracle, uh, levitations of Buddhist and Christian saints, um, uh, stuff that happens in Pentecostal churches all the time. The world is full of this stuff. I remember when my father died, um, my 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 parents had two cars. My father died rather suddenly. Um, and the car that my father drove uh, was a little older than the car that my mother drove of their two cars. And it never happened before that something was happening with the locks in the car. And my mother got frustrated. And so she said, Stan, cut that out. And then it never happened again. Now, what was that? I don't know. I don't know. You know, there, there's realms of questions I don't know, but my mother isn't a liar. I'm sure the things were happening with the locks. So how do we frame this or understand that? Well, I think now we're very much into a meta-modern conversation because we're not just sticking in the modern frame. And we're not just sort of, the, the post-modern was pretty effective in some ways at sort of exposing elements of modernity that modernity just sort of slid over for whatever reason but then we also realized that it is kind of impossible to live in a postmodern frame because uh that doesn't really work either so now we're sort of in the frame of saying okay well we've got all of this stuff what do we do with it and yeah. i can find two people one of whom says i believe jesus physically rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and i can I can very, in a modernistic way, sort of embrace the Apostles' Creed. Great. And they live a totally dissolute life. And another person says, I'm a little foggy on this resurrection and the ascension, but I'm, I'm really trying to live as Jesus said to live. Then you might ask the question, okay, for which person is Jesus more real? And is, is his resurrection more real? Oh, that's kind of an interesting question. So on the on the meta modern front, I, I just I want to make the case that I don't think that we're there's a danger of thinking that we've moved beyond modernism or postmodernism uh just by the fact of like not fully integrating their insights. Right. So part of part of the interesting aspect of this conversation for me is to see how much of the modern paradigm you know, we can affirm. Um, and, uh, and I don't think we have to affirm all of it. I think there's a lot that's deeply problematic about it. And I've written about that various places and the reductionism and the over emphasis of material rather than the natural, all this stuff. But, um, 
but I think that uh, if we if we just use meta modernism as sort of a way to reclaim traditional ways of thinking, then it's sort of like missing something really really important. So that's part of why I think this conversation is is important. Um, so, but but to your th then you raise this whole other thing about basically the pragmatic utility of a certain kind of uh, way of being and and believing certain things. And um, again, like that could that could all be. Uh, what would you say? That could all be of value, right? But if you're asking questions about, you know, what's real, what, you know, the ontological basis uh, for, for any of this, that like, I, I could, many people do believe many things that aren't real, but they might serve some kind of utility for them. Now, I do think it's, it's uh, worthwhile. What did you mean by real right there? I mean, in this context, that we're talking about stuff that happens in the world and that, that our language does uh it does can school spirit happen so let me address this because well you this should, is important yeah. okay so i i am interpreting this line of thought as being very uh amb amb ambivalent or no that's not the right word um conflationary and uh what's the word i'm looking for uh we're we're we're, we're speaking oh uh john for vicky uses the term all the time um amba Anyway, there's two meanings simultaneously that we're that we're alighting or that we're and we're not being clear. Uh, 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 and I think that we should be clear. Like, there's no reason why why we should uh, base this in a kind of like semantic confusion. Agreed. Um, so I, I think that there are different kinds of speech acts, right? Um, if I say to my wife, you know, or like a or recite a Shakespeare sonnet, my love is a like a red red rose, or you are like the the or not even like if I use straight up metaphor, right? Like you are the sun. Well, I, she's not really the sun, right? But she's some kind of you know what's going on there. Like, but yes, why would uh, like, you use that phrase? I mean, so, if you're really if you're really thinking poetically, and you say to your wife, "You are the sun." Yeah, because the experiences of the sun engender certain associations and connotations of light and prettiness and warmth, and that there are, there are analogs to my relationship with her. Right. But it's an analog. It's not. She is not the sun. Now, my problem is that a lot of folks engaging with traditional religion actually think that she's the sun or the equivalent of it right that like uh, no I'll, i don't think anybody would be under that be confused by that if hearing that you said this about no no that. no i'm not saying that anyone i'm saying i'm using that as an as a as a comparison to the sorts of truths people espouse about the way things are in a traditional devotional way that uh that aren't that way right like like uh did jesus ascend into the heavens did did uh, Abraham ascend into the heavens on a horse? Did the Buddha jump out of his mother's womb the day he was born and say, "Today I shall, you know, or in this life I shall achieve enlightenment"? And I think, from a modern historical critical angle, we should take very seriously that the answer to all those is no. Why? Uh, be because because uh, I, this feels to me like it shouldn't bear much kind of defending, but I can if you want. Um, uh, in in all of the re recorded uh, uh, accounts of childbirth, uh, has a has anyone ever? What percentage forth from their of childbirths <laughs> have been recorded? Uh, yes, a, a small number since you know the past what three hundred years or so, right? So, with the capacities of modern scientific thought, we can begin to identify enduring natural laws that function in reality and understand the naturalness and the regularity of nature in those terms. And I think that if we don't take that seriously, we're just throwing out the entirety of like the, the core insight of the modernist lens. No, no, no. So, I don't want to throw that out. I'm yeah. a pretty skeptical person. Okay. But why would they have written things like Abraham flying up into heaven? And why would the disciples have remembered and recorded in the haphazard way that they did in the Gospels, their recollections of their interactions with Jesus well, after yeah. the crucifixion. Like, that's a good example, right? Like, like the historical critical method reveals that they those weren't the disciples writing those things. So that's not 
eyewitness testimony to an experience. And so now we're back in the realm of history and why it matters for faith. Because no, like, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that the disciples wrote Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John. Okay. I'm saying that the people that wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are writing it down because they believe this is the testimony of the disciples. And in some cases, do they? Mark, do they? I mean, now I you're making so. a historical claim, right? Yeah, and then, I think they, they did. Okay. Okay. So then, but I then, might be wrong, but I think but, they did. But it's important, right? It really, like, if the gospels were important. written, if they were written 10 years ago by a guy named Jerry, we might not take them that seriously, right? right? If they were, right? So history really is important. And so if we use the methodologies of modern historiography to try to elucidate these texts and understand them better in these traditions, and it gives us certain answers that would say, oh, actually, you know, no, like, for example, right? Like, um, if you want to talk about the birth narratives of Christ, uh, you've got Matthew and Luke, and they tell very different stories, right? So what tradition are they account, you know, recounting? Who, who, where did that come from? You know, this sort of a thing, right? Now, sociologically, we can make great sense of these sorts of things in a modern historical critical framing. We can say, yes, look, all over the world in the pre-modern era, people told stories about things, and they wanted to imbue their stories with a sense of profundity and majesty and sublimity or or show how special something was, etc. And they do also did a lot of that in the context of a different worldview. But, but when cosmology. you say that, are you saying they did that consciously? No, I don't think so. Uh, oh. In some cases, like in, in the pseudepigraphal writings, we know that people knew that they weren't Abraham or they weren't Adam and Eve, yet they were writing under those names. Yeah. Um, and so there are a number, like the pastoral epistles in the New Testament are written like they're Paul writing, but we know that Paul didn't write them. So we someone do. was actually lying yeah. in that case. Well, we, we also know that Paul didn't physically write the book of Romans, okay. but everybody thinks he wrote it. So, but, but again, like, oh, equivocation. That was the word I was looking That's for. That's the word yeah. you're looking yeah. for. So like, again, um, let me but, throw. But that gets into this question of authorship, yeah. which itself is really tricky because uh -huh. physical authorship is one thing, but then what exactly is, and you can look at, let's say the Joanine corpus. We can use some of that fun language. Mm -hmm. who, who, who wrote all of these Joanine books? Do they arise out of the community? And and, but but this gets this again gets to be where to the moment that we started out with in terms of you know, Jordan Peterson, you know you're not gonna you're not gonna find Jordan Peterson you know really camping out on um, mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch or Pauline authorship of the Book of Timothy or uh, John the Disciple's authorship of the Book of Revelation. He's not gonna camp out on any of those things. But the kinds of arguments he makes are that not all texts are the same. And in fact, he makes an argument that basically says it's it's functionally a Darwinian argument that it could be that the truth of a text is seen by the product of the texts. In other words, you're you're sort of using a different definition of the word real. Yep. I get that. For example, who is more real to me, Uncle Sam or uh, Donald Trump? Yeah. Um, well, let me just say, I get I get the line of argumentation. I just I find that it's um, it's one line of argumentation and it's sort of it is a, being proposed simultaneous to the other one, which is actually affirming the historical accuracy of of these accounts. And so I find that there's something I don't. To use a word like disingenuous is not what I want to do because I don't think that there's any bad faith involved. I just find it intellectually, it doesn't, um, well, doesn't well, seem... It's a, it, the question is, what do you want from all well, of this stuff? Yeah, what I'd like is for people to have a sense of integrity intellectually with the sorts of standards and criteria that they use to assess uh, texts, phenomena, traditions, right? And so I see a lot of... Um, I see a lot of contradictions and uh, sort of special pleading is sort of the, the best case or the best term for this, because like all of these hermeneutical gestures could be used in support of other pre-modern uh, uh, material, right? Sure. Like why not use all of this to affirm, if you want to talk about uh, using, if you want to talk about looking at outcome as sort of being the litmus test for whether a, test, or a text is real, like Buddhists are pretty cool. They're pretty nonviolent, yeah. pretty compassionate. Yeah. Yeah. So like maybe we should just say, 
yeah, the, uh, the, the teachings of the Buddha and everything that was written down that was sort of put in his mouth is real. Now for the record, I'm not, I'm not being, um, uh, what sort of, this isn't, uh, I'm equal opportunity here, right? If you look at the the texts that relate the Buddhist teachings, they were written hundreds of years after he lived, right? right. So how much of that is oral tradition and how much of that was what he actually said and that sort of a thing? But it's we don't even too. have to go this far. I mean, yeah. you just go, just go to any Pentecostal church and I'd say you can go to almost any church, period. Mm -hmm. And you're awash in all of these issues. And as a pastor, I'm awash in all of these issues. Pastor, I believe God is telling us to do X. Yeah. All right. Well, how am I, how am I going to figure that out? Am yeah. I thinking that somebody on a big chair is going to move his lips and that's going to come down to him? Um, and, and pastors have been dealing with this. In fact, we've all yeah. been dealing with this all of our life. Yeah. I don't believe your father. Um, I don't believe your father wanted this, wanted this for you. I remember when I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, the worst pastors to deal with were the dead pastors. <laughs> That's because at least if the pastor was alive, I could go to him and I could ask him a question, but I had to deal with the dead pastors. The pastor never would have wanted this for his church. I can't argue with that, but yeah. yet we live in the midst of it. And when we get into this question of the meta modern, this is exactly what we're dealing with because this prison that the Bible was in, you know, all of these arguments that you're giving me, I have read, I've got, you know, plenty of books that this is an entire wave that went through modernity. And, and so after the dust had settled, after the, um, after the documentary hypothesis had been chewed up and there was endless warfare, is this the Yahwist or is this the priestly and on and on and on, you know, someone like Robert Alter comes through and says, Hey, but you know, the way that text is actually laid out, it's really kind of brilliant because they were talking about these other things. And whereas everybody sort of wanted to fight about, you know, well, what, you know, did, did Jonah really happen? Uh, everybody wanted to fight about this. Life went on with all sorts of people. And for the most part, the, the people who are, are really worried about, um, well, let's see, the, the physical correspondencism of the ancient world with respect to the text that we are reading. Those are those are really fun questions to dive into. But, but for the most part, I, I think they're not, not as real as actually what the text has produced all throughout history. OK, but all right. So I'll be really real. Uh, I, I all think right. That, <laughs> I think that one. One of the things authentic. That, yeah, right, that the text has produced is a lot of suffering and a lot of, of violence, a lot of warfare, a lot of self-delusion, a lot of problems. And so I don't think we can just point to the text and be like, well, maybe they're not, you know, real historically, but they produced a lot of good because not even that really holds up. It's sort of like, actually, and this gets to some of that. Uh, well, we can we can come back to this. But the the idea that like someone's cancer gets miraculously healed by God because, hey, because he, he told me or something, right? It's sort of like, oh, okay, what kind of a God does that? And like, look at what else is going on in the world. Like, why yeah. does God, you know, oh, I got a great parking space this right. morning because I was praying and it happened and it was, it's like, oh, okay, cool. Like, what about famine? <laughs> what about the Holocaust, right? So like, it, it doesn't, it, it creates a lot of, uh, of issues uh, that we should, we should take very seriously. And um, I, I think that also you're, the way you're framing it downplays the profound impact that this stuff has on intellectual people, that people find it incredibly difficult to assent to a religious faith that seems like they need to just ignore all of the fact of 2000 years of, of history and science uh, that now they have to just check that at the door because, okay, why? Because this will improve my life or something like that. Right. And so actually a lot of the meaning crisis is a, a consequence of the fact that like, it's very hard for people to put uh, to assent to this stuff. And we can, we can, make hermeneutical gestures and say, ah, but language and what do we mean by real? And what do we mean? You know, what's a symbol and all this stuff. It's like, that just doesn't cut it for some people of like, it, and also in the last thing about the special pleading, it's like, why do this for Christianity? Why not do it for any of the other traditions? What 
all these things could be used to justify any claim, any story from the past. I mean, this is the same kind of actual like postmodern rhetoric that gets used these days in like alternative facts and what do we mean by a fact and who's to say and all this stuff. And so what we really need to grapple with is like history matters, facts matter, uh, stories do matter, and even false stories can be meaningful and helpful for people, but then let's own them as false stories that are meaningful and helpful, or how can we do that? Is that even possible? Those are the questions that I feel like a metamodern Christianity has to grapple with, but if we're still maintaining the possibility that like people levitate, maybe babies burst out of their wombs and do crazy stuff because we don't have all the records for every birth and, you know, all that kind of way of looking at reality, then we're like, I think from a modern historical critical lens and integrating that frame, we're just ignoring all of the uh, the insights of the modern world and we're not coming to grips with it. So if we're going to have a robust, strong Christianity going forward, it's got to be able to do something that I'm not hearing coming out of uh, the, this conversation. So I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with that. Uh, and what I've heard from you is mostly the sum of the modernist and the postmodernist critique. Well, I haven't even gotten much into the postmodernist stuff, which gets more into no, like but social there's a, but, but when yeah. you when you basically so this is the funny thing. Our hope is that if we can get our language, and this is where I wanted to bring in McGill Christ. Mm. Because I, I don't know if you're familiar with Ian McGill Christ at all at all. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. Hemisphere so you basically guy, got this know. idea that you've got this two perspectives on the world. And one is the one is the I, I I'm dyslexic, so I always get the two confused. So the master brain and the emissary brain. Mm -hmm. and that way, I don't have to worry about right and left because that's a problem to, for I, me. I, every time I talk right and left, I literally have to put my hands out in front of yeah, me. Yeah, I know, say, me uh, too. Ah, uh, okay, left. Yeah. When when I listen to your critique, I hear. Well, for, first of all, with a modern critique. The question is, well, if we get all of the physicalist correspondence correctly, then we can. The difficulty with this is that phys the emissary brain, that physicalist arrangement is sneaking in an eschatological hope. Hmm. Because, I mean, you just did what what's really funny is because you're we're we want to argue what Thomas saw and when did he see it? <laughs> when we just I'd like to go deeper than that. Well, but... when you just said yeah. this like, was text there has Thomas? caused endless suffering throughout human history. I don't think you can do that math with modernity. Mm, true. Because endless history, is that a thing? I mean, all of human history, is that a thing? Is Western civilization a thing? The reason we've got beyond modernity is because we want the, the, the more we work the program, the more we see it's unworkable. Because the problem with facts aren't that we don't know any. The problem is that we know too many. And this is where John Verveke, Jordan Peterson, Jonathan Peugeot's, this is where all this work has come in. Because if you say the Bible has caused, caused tremendous suffering in human history, well, then you're going to have to, in a modernist frame, tell me about human history. And neither of us have enough lifetime for that. And it's not accessible to us. And well, we just tell you a lot about the suffering <laughs> of of the religious wars, and you go back and the you know I mean it's 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 all documented. Like it's I, I don't see that being as a particularly controversial claim that uh, that. But we can't run the experiment the other way. We can't run the experiment. Well, let's 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 talk about Brian. Let's say somewhere along the line there was a story that Brian rose from the dead instead of mm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he said, Best, blessed are the cheesemakers instead mm -hmm. of the peacemakers. I mean, we can, we can insert Brian back 2,000 years and say, okay, can we do the math if, let's say, history would have been better if the story of Brian was truer than the story of Jesus? Well, I don't can think we that's really the question. Do that math in a no, way? I, well, let me clarify that. I don't think that that's... Uh, I don't think that's the, the question. The question is, what do we do today knowing what we know, how do we integrate the insights of religious tradition? 
Uh, I think that no matter what, I mean, my understanding of history is that we had to develop, we had to learn, we had to come to a greater understanding of reality. And so inevitably, we were going to see the world in religious terms, uh, in mythological terms for a long, 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 long time. So I don't think there is a, a counter version of that. And you look at Piagetian developmental learning theory, like we were always bound to assimilate knowledge to our own constructs. And so we were always going to tend to do anthropomorphism and uh, and animism and artificialism and all that. And it's taken a long time, but over the course of human history, we have started to see more and more of the laws and the, the mechanical nature of things and the naturalistic aspects of things and the chance things and all that. And that's expanded our, our picture. And so now the question is, well, what, what do we, what do we keep from tradition? And, uh, and I think uh, what I thought you were making the point a minute ago was that modernity doesn't have a great track record at all either. You know, I mean, you look at the 20th century. I love modernity. Trust well, me. I got an electric yeah. car. I love right. that sucker. No, it no, no. I just, yeah. And, and we have to integrate and appreciate that. So I'm yep. not anti-modern. I'm just saying that, uh, it, it's the case about saying, oh, all the suffering has been caused by this particular way of seeing reality. Well, it's like, well, yeah, a lot of the totalitarian ideologies of the modern period also created a lot of suffering. So that shouldn't be the only litmus test here. Uh, but what I am saying is that I do believe that we have moved through history and gained more understanding of reality. And now we're in a place to look back and look at the religious traditions and try to determine how much of this do we carry forward and how do we understand them? And and for me, that's what I'm grappling with, because I, I think if we just say, well, yes, people actually went up into heaven and there were these miracles. We're not like really taking modernity seriously. Um, so but maybe uh, maybe I'm I'm overly reiterating my my thesis at this point. I have never been at a funeral. Well, here's a, here's a question. <laughs> that's not really a question, an observation. As modernity has re, has has sort of increased, we've had less funerals. Mm. Because why? And it's funny what seems real to people. Now, we can have a debate about the epilepsy of Julius Caesar. And, you know, to what degree was Caesar's epilepsy, or was it epilepsy? Because, of course... They didn't have the word epilepsy. Mm -hmm. They, they, you know, Julius Caesar. There was a spirit that would 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 sometimes seize Julius Caesar. Yeah, and that, of course, was understood in a particular way. And, but a lot of the spirit of Julius Caesar was pretty significant historically. And part of how I understand the recession of modernity is that we have fought a lot about the biochemical processes in Julius Caesar's brain, even though we can't hope to actually approach that in any modernist way, when there have been many more quite real things impacting us that have been around us the whole time, we just haven't had language for it. Hmm. And part of what's happening is that people are, well, you mentioned the meaning crisis. I, I think... As as John frames the meaning crisis, you can find episodes of the meaning crisis all throughout history. Um, but I think he's right that there's been an intensification, and mm -hmm. that that this intensification has everything to do with modernity. Because if if you want to if if and say I don't agree that either. Avoiding suffering or achieving suffering is necessarily the goal by which we should measure everything with. Mm. Because truth be told, I think the reality of my life is that certain sufferings that I have had to endure, I, I, if, 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 he, if I had to go back, I'd very much like to avoid them. But certain riches that I have been blessed with have been a direct result of those same sufferings. Mm -hmm. And so even just say using suffering as a litmus test for value, I think is some someplace I'd rather not go. Mm -hmm. Yet, if we are to make that argument about suffering, to go to your grandma's bed and she looks up at you and says, 
I'm scared of dying. I've always thought that, you know, Jesus would take me home. Mm. Take me home. Home? You mean a house? No, no, that's not what she means. Home. Well, what do you mean, Grandma? And she has a few vague ideas, probably from, from a childhood Bible or a whole bunch of Hollywood movies or mm -hmm. ideas about who Jesus is. And you say, oh, gee, oh, Grandma. I don't know why you bother with any of this. <laughs> it's all been disproven. Um, why don't we just up? Why don't we just? Why don't we just up the? Uh, why don't we just up the the drugs a little bit more, and um, then pretty soon you will no longer be. Uh, nobody says that. No, nobody. Nobody should say that. Nobody should say that. Yeah. So why? Why on one hand do we have this urgent need to disavow people? of their myths in the cause of suffering. Good question. So here's the way I would look at that is that um, uh, there are certain pastoral uh, activities and certain capacities of someone in a, uh, in a ministering capacity um, that are about skillful means. It's about meeting people where they're at. It's about uh, reading a situation and see what would bring the most benefit to people in a particular context. Um, and then related to that, it's about knowing uh, what people are capable of and 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 what degree of depth uh, they're interested in pursuing uh, intellectual questions and 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 philosophical ones and exploring to the the depths of reality. Um, and people vary a lot in that. Um, and so, uh, if you see someone who's, who, who is interested in and is passionate to learn and to, to, to question and to, and to, and to be willing to deal with the uncomfortableness and the cognitive dissonance and all that stuff and really try to deepen their spiritual journey by questioning and exploring their faith. And like, that should be, uh, that should itself be ministered to, but if someone's dying and not interested in that stuff at all and has no concern for it or maybe they were but now they're facing the end of their 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 days and so they're fear uh, fearful and concerned then obviously at a at a humane level this is not this is not uh enter the the mix here um but all that said right we're trying to and the, well this relates directly actually so I'll throw this into the mix too um to be clear i don't find the answer uh, satisfactory from the modernist lens. I think that I think that is kind of the point you're really getting at in, in this story, and I'm sympathetic to that. So I'm not, and I don't want people to misunderstand me here. As I'm not a, a modernist trying to be like, you know, oh, this is this is what we, the takeaway needs to be, and we all need to be atheists, and and all these stories are bunk and all that. No, but we do need to move through modern thought. We do need to grapple with those questions, right? But what we do need is a psychologically fulfilling uh answer to the enduring human condition and to understanding what the sacred is understanding what we mean by things like spirituality and meaning and i personally think and I, that we can actually have very satisfying compelling answers to those things that do justice to all the facts quote unquote from a historical critical lens and the postmodern cr critique you really don't want to say all the facts why you not? really don't want to say all the facts. Because again, this is the whole point of the conversation. None of us can or ever will have all the facts. And how we manage facts, combinatorial explosiveness, if you go mm. to John Verveke language, how we manage combinatorial explosiveness has everything to do with all of these questions. Well, as someone who has made the point repeatedly that we use language in all sorts of ways, right? All the facts is an, an expression. I yeah, it is. Say, don't, don't believe that a person's mind can contain all the facts. I'm and just and, saying and that, so you'd like to, you'd like to poke on this resurrection. I'd like to poke on all the facts. Sure. Because well, I think I, we're leading people down a, down a, <laughs> a bad road. No, I, I poke away. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm don't uh, misinterpret what I'm saying. So I'll clarify. No, I understand. Like. I'm sorry. Okay. I, shouldn't, but, I shouldn't be so pedantic. But what I do mean though, right. Is that, as best as we can 
know what is up. And, and I also, it's very important to build into our understanding that we're always learning and that we never have the final answer. One of the ways I think we can tackle some of this stuff you were bringing up from earlier is that uh, we shouldn't presume that the scientific paradigm is the final one, that we, that there's not a lot more to learn about reality that like, oh, actually maybe people can levitate, but rather than see that as sort of like a supernatural phenomenon, it's like, oh, actually like we realize that there's this whole other field going on here that, you know, uh, this uh, Hadron Collider just brought our attention to, and now we can do all these ex experimental studies that can show that like certain things and it actually, you know, partakes in uh, sociolinguistic, you know, whatever. Like my point is we can naturalize uh, th those understandings of things because um, the natural is the real. And that to me is also a very important aspect of, of the kind of modern insight that I want to, that I want to be true to. Um, so anyway, just, just to wrap all that up, I, um, I think that all that is possible. Like, I think that we can have a spiritually, psychologically, socially effective and satisfactory answer to questions of meaning and, and the sacred and all these things in, in a way that, that does that, uh, with, with great intellectual integrity. Um, and that's, that's what I'm excited about. And that's what I'd like to see more in brought into the conversation. Um, so that's all. If, if you want to know what the epitome of modernity is in language, just track the use of the word we. Because right away when I started making my videos, I started talking about a monarchical vision, mm. which is sort of the essential modernist move. I am a monarchical going to, vision? A monarchical vision. Okay. It, I, I sort of move out of the fact that I was born a specific, specific year to specific parents, and now I am going to speak over all of mm. eternity right. with this we. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's because well, we can have a more satisfying, because the, the problem with that sentence is, of course, once you start paying attention to people... <laughs> And uh, the, the, the at least the sample of people that I've known, so I'll try not to insert people for we because we often use those in the same way. Uh -huh. What different people find satisfying, again, if that is the standard, is remarkably difficult um, because it's remarkably varied. And I think one way to th see this might be when you look at the meaning crisis, and you know John Verveke's thesis is that the death of the legacy religions provoked an intensification and a widespread meaning crisis, because the kinds of things that religions, that the kinds of things that religions used to provide to people on a broad scale, mm -hmm. is no longer available to them for all of the reasons that you have just laid out. Mm -hmm. Now, then the question is, okay, so now what? Because yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I agree with you that modernity and the Enlightenment have produced many wonderful things for us, things that I enjoy, things that, in fact, Haitians in the Dominican Republic would love to enjoy. I mean, if you really want to solve Haiti— Maybe just tell everyone in the in the in the land of Haiti free pass to the United States, just like they did to Cuba. Most of Haiti will, you know, and we'll get you on the boat. You know, let's take in nine million Haitians. It's not that many people. Let's take in nine million Haitians this year. They can come to the United States, live wherever they want. And Haitian immigrants have had an amazing track record of coming into the United States and flourishing in our our Western capitalist society. So all of that is is well and good, and I get that. Now, one of the things that I've been seeing in my journey is that people that we did a little event in Southern California and appended to the event is a little tour of an Orthodox church. So we go to this Orthodox church, and I've got plenty of bones to pick with just about every other religious tradition from my own. I've got even more bones to pick with my own because I know it better. But I'm sitting there in this church and I'm looking at a whole bunch of young men on their knees, 
kissing a box of relics on their mm. way out. And mm. a number of these young men, I know because I've talked to many of these young men just seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, were big fans of Sam Harris. Mm. And I thought, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh -huh. Why would these people that were worshiping at the feet of Sam Harris, now, oh, they weren't really worshiping at his feet. No, but if you sort of understand the relationship between attention and worship, they paid a lot of attention to Sam Harris. They paid a lot of attention to the new atheists and everything. Mm -hmm. And now here they are in Southern California, knees on a million dollars worth of marble from the old world, putting their lips on a box, probably full of germs from all the other dudes' lips. And, you know, because someone says that the stuff in this box is actually associated with, and I'm a Protestant, so I've got, I tell you, you show me a box of relics and boy, all that Protestant DNA kicks in right away in my yeah. mind. Okay. But I watch that and I say, huh, you know who's not having a meaning crisis? Those dudes on the floor. And if you talk to them, as I've spoken with these guys, you know who would say their life has taken a significant upgrade? Those guys. Well, and, and you have to say, huh. Now, I fully get, because mm -hmm. I've got in my little corner of the internet, Peugeot's corner has plenty of those guys. Verveke's corner, they tend to be working other ways. My little corner, I tend to got a lot of the Christian skeptics and deconstructionists. And so I... I many, many, many people have come to me and said, Pastor, I would love nothing better than to believe. Mm -hmm. I love nothing better. And I just can't, I just can't get my mind around the virgin birth. I just can't get my mind around Thomas touching Jesus' wounds. I just can't go there. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, I'll pray for you. I can give you some sociological arguments that would say, if you really want to believe these things, start hanging out with people who do for about three or four years, and you'll probably get there. Well, what would happen if you hung out with more relic box kissing people? <laughs> well, and that's that's the experiment we're running right now, because I don't know. I, I suspect, even just based on early results, that some of them will be kissing relics for now, and some of them will probably stop and might go back to forms of Protestantism that they grew up with. But, some of them might stay yeah. in Orthodoxy. Some of them might become Anglican. Some of them might not even go to church all that much. I mean, it's going to be all over the map. And that's where I say, again, I have way too many facts because I've talked to way too many people. And it's going to be messy. Well, briefly, I would just say that I don't see the difference between believing in a virgin birth versus believing that a box contains a relic and and that if you kiss it it, it gives you some quality of of grace like to me those are both what i would think of as sort of like non-scientific claims and then if you're outside the, the the context of naturalism which both of those claims are then how do you adjudicate between you know which, which is more believable versus another and that's one of the benefits of a naturalistic framing is it's like whatever problems there are, and there are many problems with the scientific framework and, and with reductionism that creeps in with modernity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is a kind of remarkable coherence to a lot of it as well. And maybe people would take issue with that because obviously there's a lot on the fringes that we're still trying to work out, but like there are standard models of how, you know, physics works and chemistry and stuff and like a remarkable uh, integrity and coherence to the whole thing. And you don't find that in the religious uh, context where some people will say, yes, well, of course, you know, I'll pray for for you if you don't believe in the in the virgin birth but if you go and kiss those relics well gosh you know uh, good luck fella you know it's sort of like that's hard to adjudicate um but but i i wanted to and but, i'll but, give you an opportunity but, but let me to just to, talk yeah. about that frame sure because what you just did was bring in the modernist frame yeah you said the virgin birth and kissing relics are the same thing well i didn't I, now they're not no, the no, same you but basically they are... said but again because physically, they're not the same thing. Right. I just want to, we've been very careful with trying to, you know, not allied things. So I was like, oh, no, well, just, you know, I said what I said. But, but, but yes, that uh, yeah. is the Enlightenment critique. Yeah. Yeah. 
and Protestants tried to keep the virgin birth and tried to no longer kiss relics. Yeah. And they wound up. It's a slippery slope. <laughs> well, some of them threw it all away and said, yeah. no longer believe in the virgin birth. And I no longer kiss relics. Others kept one and not the other. So, right. but again, the point I'm trying to make is that the fact that you saw the connection between those two things, mm -hmm. that is a spirit. That is a frame. Mm -hmm. That a frame. is yeah. now, yeah, you'd see, you, you like the frame. Yeah, but I wouldn't you didn't call like it a, the spirit. a spirit because when, when I'm talking to a pastor who's trying to, make the argument for supernatural non-naturalistic phenomena if there's a word another like, frame if a word like spirit gets into the conversation i want i'm like that's a, i'm not sure if we mean the same thing by that right i mean uh, so it becomes very so there's a helpful there's a helpful word because then we're actually gonna have something to talk about because i can use the word in terms of school spirit and the spirit that is actually in the house you grew up in yeah and now i can also talk about the spirit of the enlightenment yeah. Now, if I frame it that way, see, frame is a very new word. Mm. And natural, supernatural, that's also a very new framing. Mm -hmm. Those are very new terms that have come along. In fact, frame is very new. But if I say spirit, then suddenly we have new avenues. Because, you know, what I, what I hear from people who say, I can't believe this stuff in this way. And I and the, what, basically what I hear then, my own framing is I hear, okay, we're sort of still stuck in the modernist fundamentalist fight because mm. that's what that fight was about. Well, sure, the the modernist fundamentalist fight, which largely I would admit this conversation has sort of been rehashing, yeah. is well, I would I see. I don't think I'm a fundamentalist in. This no, no, I, do, I didn't mean to suggest that. I'm I'm not, saying... I don't take it as an insult. I mean, okay. I love fundamentalists. All right, but well, and and there certainly yeah. is some of that in there, but but my whole point is, yeah. When you get into this term like meta modernity, we mm -hmm. are we are trying to get past modern, postmodern, and then we're in many ways we're sort of in the Verveki side of the conversation. How can we move? How can we? How can we relieve people of the meaning crisis and not lose elements of the modern and the postmodern? Mm -hmm. And I would argue, well, well we're going to be playing with elements here. And that's I can do basically elements. where the conversation lies. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I agree with that. Um, and yeah, we can we can start to wrap up. I know we've been talking for a while. I, we're, I'm also happy to keep talking if you want. Uh, but, you know, I also don't oh, this too many, fun. I, I I don't make I too this. many demands on, on the audience. But just to respond to that last part real quick. I, um, don't, no demands on the audience. They can't listen to <laughs> that's true. Just, People are listening to Joe Rogan. They yeah. go four or five hours. This is I mean, true. This is uh, true. Um, but, but I do have to land because I do have some other things I got to do. OK, yeah. I, I just want to say briefly. Yeah, no, I, I mean, this conversation, I think, largely did sort of rehearse a kind of classic modern pre-modern uh, debate. Right. And um, and and that was helpful to some degree. Um, but it also does, I think, remain at an impasse. Um, and so. Uh, I think well, it's... But I'm going to say something that's a little bit touchy here. And I, sure. I hope, I hope, I hope you understand this is a good faith argument. Yeah. You're the one that's demanding. They give up physicalist connections with things like the virgin birth and the resurrection, these things. Mm. That's not me. Yeah. Well, I'm not demanding that anyone give anything up. I'm grappling with intellectual history and, trying to find a way forward for spirituality. Right. And many, many people are facing that struggle, as yes. you just alluded to. That's like, yes. I, I'd like to believe, but I can't just do yes. it. So, I'm But not... some aren't. They're kissing boxes with old with bones from who knows where, talking right. as a and, Protestant. <laughs> and, uh, and just briefly to that point too, right? You said, well, they're not having a meaning crisis. It's like, well, I mean, um, I one, this is really important uh, to the degree that we we think about the realness of things also in, in the consequences, right? And I think that this traditionalist turn uh, is not going to lead to good consequences for people. Uh, it, it, for, for some folks, it might just be what they need. It might just fit the bill and they're very happy and it allows them to flourish, in which case, I think, again, to bring back the developmental angle here, we have to just be 
celebratory of that, that people are going to be approaching these things at different, uh, different levels and, and different degrees of depth. And, uh, and that we shouldn't, um, ex demand is not the thing here. It's more like there is a crisis, uh, that in this moment of intellectual history, people are struggling to know how to do the meaning thing outside of religion, given the critiques of, of modernity and post-modernity. So what I'm trying to do is, is, chart that path forward. And for me, I would say that there are certain commitments that have really resonated with me through my own spiritual journey of deconstructing certain things and going through the historical critical process and the study of all that, that like, yeah, I feel very confident that like, you know, I land on certain uh, claims about reality uh, and, uh, and then I want to carry those forward. Uh, and I want to carry those forward though, out of what has been largely a reductionistic and a nihilistic um, and an atheistic and a materialistic frame. And I want to bring that into a frame where uh, those things don't have to be viewed in that light, that we can actually have a fully naturalistic mentality, uh, but that we can also have a fully flourishing sense of meaning and spirituality and sense of the sacred. And I believe that's, I mean, I have my own senses of how that, that, that looks and what that, um, what that, yeah, what that looks like. Uh, but um, but I, I really appreciate your perspective and I, I appreciate you two very much being, you know, on the ground and in a congregation and, um, you know, uh, uh, being a part of people's faith journeys in the in the day to day that you're navigating. And so um, well, let me let me tell you about Job, because sure. this is an easy one. The guy named Job lives in the Netherlands. And what's fun about Job is this all happened on video. Job was really suffering, struggling with depression, was trying to, you know, deal with his depression with diet, exercise, modern medicine, all of the, all of the things, all of the modern things, dealing with all of that. Finds Jordan Peterson. Jo Job's a hardcore atheist. <laughs> it's all bullshit. <laughs> hardcore atheist. Finds Jordan Peterson. Starts watching Jordan Peterson. And I'm using Job because there are dozens of people that I've talked to that have the same story. Mm -hmm. Starts watching videos of Jordan Peterson. And he's like, I've been fighting my depression for a long time. I, I'm obsessively, this is 2016, 2017, 2018. I'm obsessively watching Jordan Peterson because I don't know why. I, I just, after I watch Jordan Peterson, I feel better. And it's like, mm. You know, every time you get a little bottle of pills, you have all these side effects. Uh, there's side effects to watching YouTube because there's spirits coming through the screens. Boy, that sounds really wooey, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but you have to understand what I mean by spirits, like school spirit, the spirit in your house. There's spirits coming through the screens. Um, and so Job and I just continue to have a bunch of conversations. And, you know, he starts out as just a total atheist. And the more we talk, I can't really take credit because... All of this stuff is changing in him. And then he's like, you know, I've started praying. Well, why would you do that? Well, you know, and he's watching me on YouTube. And then, you know, and then he's, before you know it, he's he's a volunteer firefighter. And the fire, the fire department's right across, I've been to his house. Now it's right across the street from his house. A couple of those guys go to church. So he's like, Go into a building and listen to somebody in a robe ramble for an hour. How much harm can it do? Starts going to church. You know, bit by bit by bit. And then, you know, he was baptized as an infant because he's in the Netherlands and that was pretty common. And so then he makes, he finds himself believing. And, and he's a smart guy. Um he works in IT. He, he for a long time he was sending me books and sending me, you know, books to read. And this is I mean, this is a very smart guy, successful in business, all of this stuff, you know. And eventually he just finds himself believing, and he just finds it to be the most hilarious thing in the world, because you know to think that he that he would believe, and then he joins his church, and then his church wants to make him an elder, and he's and he's in a. He's in a Dutch Reformed church, which is sort of connected to the denomination that I am a part of. And but he really finds that praying the rosary really helps. Now, my grandfather, if my grandfather had heard that someone in the Dutch Reformed Church is praying the rosary, 
he would have said, there's no business of a reformed Christian praying the rosary. Mm -hmm. That's what Job does. And he prays the rosary because he finds it helps. Mm -hmm. And now he's had a couple of kids and he's an elder in his church. And he's, he's still got, he's got more questions than when he started. And he's got more he can talk about these questions than when he began. Now that he's, you know, neck deep involved in a church, he's got even more questions. But if you'd ask him, what, what about this? You used to be a, a perfectly normal person who used to say that the Bible and religion, it was all bullshit. And now you're an elder in a church and you do the crazy thing of praying a rosary while you're an elder in the church. If you would ask me what metamodernity looks like, I would say it looks like Job. Mm. That Now, there's been some definitely some loosening of a whole bunch of things from the Enlightenment. And he's a, he's a computer scientist. And so he knows science. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he's, he's very much living in this world. And if you ask him questions about this or that, he could talk for a long time about his questions and his questions won't be far from modernity or post-modernity. Now, a lot of people might jump in and say, well, I really want to know about his politics. And I would say, why? Because remember what I said early on, when the church sort of hollowed out, we were left with political mm -hmm. activists and therapists. Mm. Okay, fine. There's nothing wrong with politics. There's nothing wrong with therapy. But when you talk about meta-modern spirituality, it looks a lot like Job. Mm. And it looks a lot like these guys kissing relics. And it looks a lot like you. And, and so people are getting to the other end of both yeah. modernity and post-modernity and it's kind of a mess mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah. the, the the monolithic traditions that were number one probably not quite as monolithic as we imagine they were because a sure. close reading of the new testament says boy that fight between the judaizers and and yeah. paul was a fierce one mm -hmm. and then of course the church that emerges you know, there's all sorts of mess and fights and all of that going on. And all the way through history, I think people are wrestling with, what do we mean by spirit? Why? What? What? What is the significance of that box in the corner of that church in Southern California? What? Why would it make sense for an elder in a Dutch Reformed church to pray the rosary. I think that's yeah. what we're coming into. Yeah, I think that's that that resonates a lot. And uh, I I think that that arc uh, that Job went through sounds like a very good one. It sounds like a, a one that that led to a very good place. And yeah, without getting, I mean, I I don't really care about their politics, but uh, but to the degree that they're living a full, robust life, flourishing. They're not depressed anymore. They have a rich family life. They have deep relationships. They have all that. Um, that sounds great, you know? Uh, uh, that is one arc. And I, I, I think of whatever this metamodern Christianity thing is or just metamodern religion, there'll be many different kinds of arcs. And there's a plurality of different ways of thinking about this. So this is a conversation. It's a, it's a dialogue. It's an exploration of what those different possibilities are. And just because I'm coming at it from a certain angle, I don't want to preclude other possibilities uh, for, for these things. And I'm probably even in the minority in, in this conversation space around what this looks like. But just briefly, I will also say that another narrative arc could be presented. And you can call this person Brendan uh, Graham Dempsey, you know, who, who, who started out maybe a bit more where Job ended up uh, yeah. in a religious tradition and had a deep devotional religious life and a deep prayer life and was deeply connected with his faith, cared about it so much he decided to go study it and, yeah. and devote his life to it, yeah. goes to school, studies it, yeah. finds that when you apply the methods of the modern historical critical approach to that, 
things produce profound contradictions and difficulties and cognitive dissonances that when Brendan goes back to his family and his church, tries to get uh, get answers to these questions, finds that people don't want to talk about that or don't have yeah. satisfactory answers or feel threatened by it uh, to a point where eventually he has to give all that up and say, all right, well, I have to just uh, follow where I feel like the truth is leading. And even though this is profoundly uncomfortable and, 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 and hard to do, uh, no longer being able to just naively believe in a certain perspective and then deal with depression and then deal with nihilism and then have to work through that and then find your way to a framework frame uh, where there is a, a, a return of meaning and a new understanding and an interpretation of meaning and an understanding that 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 arc, that that narrative development actually has a developmental logic to it uh, and that that people's faiths can evolve and their understanding of reality can deepen and evolve and change. And that God as a concept and as a reality can evolve and change and to feel a profound new sense of meaning and insight and importance and vocation even in pursuing that. And then devote yourself again to trying to follow that thread into the future and to help other people who are also grappling with the, with the, the, the depression and the, and the struggle that comes from not having that faith and not knowing what to do with it because you can't just return to where you came from. And that to me is also a very meta modern arc. And uh, I think both of those arcs can find a place in this. And I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, other people's arcs and, and how that, that pans out. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a diverse space and I, I, I welcome I really welcome what's happening. I think it's deeply valuable that we're starting to move into this conversation. When I've talked to Verveke in the past, it's come up like, what about the legacy you know, religions? What about this? And how do we bring in uh, the, the ancient uh, religions in a way and carry them forward? But now I feel like we're really grappling with that directly, at least as it pertains to Christianity. And so I look forward to having conversations with like people like Paul Ann Leitner and I don't know, maybe Christian Wyman, other people who are really exploring this stuff. Uh, and I really deeply appreciated this conversation. And I, I appreciate you taking the time and dealing with my uh, my my questions and my 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 uh, whatever queries and uh, probing, uh, you know, critiques even. So, uh, but yeah, so this is I, I enjoyed this. I, I hope you did, too. Oh, no, I did. I did. I did. And, you know, it, what's funny is that we sort of did a Randall's conversation in reverse, because if we if I had been hosting you. Mm. We definitely would have spent an hour of 40 half hour to an hour just on your story. Mm. And I think that, you know, when I talk about the monarchical vision mm. and I talk about meta modernity in modernity, you sort of, you sort of start from we and all, mm. I think in meta modernity, you start with you. Sure. And then you sort of build out the world from there and, and, and I think I, I think that that point of approach is not arbitrary, mm -hmm. because sure. again, when you look at especially Peugeot in this, but Peterson and Verveke to a degree, but especially Peugeot in this, even if you look at let's say the history of philosophy, this turn to the phenomena to phenomenology mm -hmm. and the other approach, because the. And this is where this is where you have tension, and this is where okay, I haven't said too much to get myself in trouble, but this is where the this is where some of the tension lies. Let's say in the modernist fundamentalist thing, is in modernity we sort of swoop up on top and want to say, I need I want to make a declaration with respect to the the state of particular molecules and atoms 2000 years ago in a geography half around the world and that's going to be consequential mm. now we spend all the time on the state and then well why is that consequential mm -hmm. because that then gets really murky and it's really nice if we can say zebras don't have stripes because then suddenly we can just you know categorize zebras and horses all the way that we want to but when we begin the conversation, not up here, but sort of down here and sure. out, then I think for the most part, um, I, I think generally speaking, the if the if meta if meta modernity is provoked by all of the stuff that John Bravaki talks about with respect to Cogsci combinatorial explosiveness the stuff jordan peterson talks about when he begins maps of meaning a world of objects or a form for action 
if you start with the individual and move out from there, mm -hmm. you already have a pre-baked in more relevant yeah. collection of facts you're dealing with than if we try to start with all of human history. Sure. Yeah. Because no, I, I agree. who the hell am I to know what happened in all of human history? Yeah. But now I can speak to what I saw. Sir. Yeah. No. And it's interesting too, you know, especially well, when also you, when you're on the internet and people watch your stuff, you never quite know who knows what about your story and whether that is another opportunity to have to get into that or, or not. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, and you know, so maybe that's an opening for, a, a, yeah, a maybe deepening. we'll do another, we'll do a randos. We'll start, we'll start yeah. with you. Okay. Because to me, the most interesting thing about you is not whether or not you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus. That's not the most interesting thing about you. I'm kind of interested in it. Hmm. The most interesting thing about you is your story. Yeah. Because you are not an accumulated set right. of ideas of physical rearrangements that happened in the past. Yeah. You were born in a certain year to a group of parents, had some experiences, encountered a bunch of things, and that has developed into where you are now. And again, as a pastor, I'm really interested in people because yeah. I think people are amazing. And so I have I have friends that have very different beliefs about all sorts of arrangements of 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 atoms in history. Uh-huh. But I oh I I've got beliefs about that. Let me tell you, I've got some strong ideas about atoms in history. No, well, everything you're saying speaks to I'm sure what uh, the qualities that I'm sure make you a very uh, quality pastor <laughs> because uh, there are some pastors who care a lot more about whether you believe in that physical resurrection boy. Yeah, uh, and don't, and, don't get yeah. me wrong. I think you think it's important too. No, <laughs> I think it's important too. <laughs> but the again, yeah. the question of back to the skeptics that I talk to and they say, okay, even if people levitate, even if Jesus walked out of that cave, so what? Yeah. And, and if you look at when everybody's just focusing on, well, what do you say about that arrangement? Yeah. I think the, so what, because yeah. even no, I, in the Bible, yeah, the, so what is where all the action is? What is the implication of that? And yeah. that's actually where I find modernism to be terribly yeah. fragile Agreed. because when people sort of discount things willy nilly, I've seen, you know, I was a foreign missionary. I've seen some pretty incredible things mm -hmm. that don't really fit in the modern world. And so it's like, here's modernity with all the rules. Yeah, I've seen a lot. It's like, eh. yeah. at the same time, I believe in physics. I believe in Newtonian physics. But Newtonian physics is, of course, within a certain context yeah. that Newtonian physics works. Well, and so yeah, let's carry forward the conversation. I'm I'm glad you're open to it. I'd be happy to you know start from the beginning, the reverse way, and talk about uh, my story. And I'd love to dig into the so what question because that really is what it's all about. Um, and uh, and happy to delve into any. I mean, I feel like. We we covered a lot, and it's you know, but also there's there's so much more that we can yeah. we can explore, and so I appreciate your perspective very much. I appreciate the broader community that you're that you're uh, not just a part of, but also actively sort of tending to, uh, even ministering to, and um, I think that there's a lot that can come out of more uh, exchange and conversation, and um, and so yeah, if you'd be up for it, let's uh, let's let's keep it going. Yeah, people are gonna love this video. Trust me, they, 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 <laughs> okay, they like good. it when I get they like it when I get excited. So when you get a little feisty, all right, good. They like it well, when I get feisty. I uh, well, I'm glad to hear that. I I hopefully can can hone a little bit uh, my own thoughts about this and, and come with a, a bit more clarity because I feel like uh, uh, I uh, it, it, it's it's an interesting thing when you're exploring the the background worldview elements that go into what we affirm and why 
And so it's interesting then to have to kind of render an account for certain things that you don't often have to render an account for. Yeah. Uh, and it places, uh, you know, it's a good exercise, but um, it can be an interesting kind of, I was like, oh, I don't, I didn't think I'd have to uh, explain that, but, you know, but, but you do, you know, and that's sort of the, yeah. the, the difficulty and the challenge, but also the possibility of this sort of work in these kinds of conversations is to really uh, deepen the clarity around all that. And also to, you know, it, analyze and become aware of our own assumptions as well in the process and, and all that. So anyway, yep. um, Paul Vanderclay, thank you so much. Uh, to be continued. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs>